Hello, everybody. Got a special guest today, Wayne Shung. He's the co-founder of the Simple Heart Initiative and is known largely due to his work for DXE. Hello, Wayne. Nice to meet you. This is our first time. Yeah, it is. It's good to be here. I have a few days left before I fly off to Wisconsin for the next fight of my life. So yeah, you, this isn't the, the first one. And we, this is why we're here today meeting for the first time, because something very pertinent has happened. Um, Wayne, do you briefly want to go through what has led us to be here today and, and what you're facing? Yeah, I'm facing a felony trial and potentially 16 years in prison for removing a blind beagle puppy from a laboratory in Dane County, Wisconsin, which is one of the largest beagle breeding and research facilities in the nation. This is a facility that's been involved in some of the most notorious and horrific experiments in animal rights history. Things like force feeding dogs laundry detergent, poisoning them with chemicals and substances such as fentanyl and cocaine, uh, requiring them to go through unnecessary surgical procedures, rotator cuff tears, mutilation of their faces. And every one of these dogs lives their entire life in a cage at Ridgeland. And it's a place that is met with not just animal rights protests, but complaints even by federal and state inspectors about the violations of law happening at the facility. But for decades, no one did anything to help the dogs. So in 2017, that's what we did. We walked in, we documented exactly what we found there. And we saw a few animals that were in need of emergency medical care. We took them to the vet. And now I'm facing felony charges for doing so. Do you know specifically about the the charge, the, the, the things that take place in this Wisconsin facility? Do, do you know specifically things that happen there? Or is it kind of this broad thing that you have knowledge of? We, we know very specific things because for years, even the government's own inspectors have filed complaints about Ridgeland. So what's true in the United States and around the world is that for the most part, the fox is guarding the hen house. The regulators who are tasked with protecting animals from cruelty are usually people who used to work for the industry and plan to go back working for the industry. And that's not just true of the United States. Around the world, every single agency that I've looked at internationally, mm -hmm. even in terms of kind of uh, local efforts that you might think are more grassroots, more, more kind of personal, it tends to be the case the industry dictates how enforcement is going to happen. And so in this case, with Ridgeland Farms, I first found out about Ridgeland. I don't exactly know when, but I know back in 2006, there were reports by apparently an employee saying there were burning animals. Oh my and we gosh. hope that these are animals that were dead and being burned in a landfill, but mm -hmm. we don't know. No. And this is a place that kills lots and lots of dogs. So it's, it's thousands of dogs. So they're throwing lots of dogs in landfills and also unsanitary and dangerous conditions. And that's repeatedly been the case for the last decade. We've seen both state and federal investigators say that the flooring has problems. There are dogs who are, whose legs and feet are literally falling through holes. There are animals with foot infections that are preventing them from walking properly. There are animals going psychotic and insane. And again, these aren't our findings. These are the government's own findings. And these are illegal conditions for dogs. And yet, despite the fact that this company has been cited for illegal conditions, in fact, criminal conditions for dogs for many decades, there was never any action taken. Could you tell us more about these? Because there were three beagle, beagles who were rescued on top of this this blind um, beagle. Uh, could you yeah. tell us a little bit about them individually and what they're like? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's just, just like human beings. Every one of them is very different. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that ties them all together is they all suffer from trauma. Yeah. Um, all three of these dogs had serious foot infections when we removed them. They were kind of, and, and this is true of lots of dogs that come from cages because when you're living your entire life on wire, imagine living on concrete. Now imagine that concrete has all these holes in it, you know, and, and so your feet and your digits, your, your toes are constantly pressing up against like this hard wire. Um, and there is a polyurethane coating on the wire, but still there's been extensive research and, and documented investigative evidence showing that dogs are suffering from foot injuries just from standing on wire their entire lives, which is what these dogs experience. And so all three dogs when we came out, one of the most notable things was all of them, for example, just couldn't figure out how to walk upstairs. Oh my God. Imagine it's, we have, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of adorable video footage because it's, it's cute because, <laughs> but I mean, it's not typical and normal for a seven year old dog to not be able to walk upstairs, whether due to pain or because just psychologically they're too traumatized. But the thing, the other thing about all these dogs is they all suffer from PTSD and post-traumatic stress disorder is not just something that human beings experience from being in war zones, from experiencing some horrific crime, animals can experience it too. And a lot of people probably listen to this podcast may have a rescue dog or cat who
who suffered some horrible trauma and they know how triggered they can become from a sound, from the sight of something new. And, and this dog, Julie, who we rescued three years ago, and, and the other dogs are suffering from similar ailments, not quite the same, but similar. The moment she hears something that she's not familiar with, she will immediately revert back to this behavior she engaged in when she was trapped in a cage, which mm -hmm. is just spinning. Oh, she spins no. and spins and spins. And she always spins to the right. And, you know, it's eight years or so since we rescued her. And it still is a struggle to try and convince her to turn left. She just doesn't have the ability to do so because for, for such a long period of time when she was suffering from stress and anguish inside that cage, the only coping mechanism she had was to spin right. And so it's been imprinted into her brain. And this is just kind of what happens to not just dogs in the United States, but millions of dogs across the world. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why does this happen to, to beagles specifically? Why, why are they a breed of dog who's being tested yeah. on so frequently for people who don't know? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty wild story. But back in the 1950s, um, and I just huge shout out to my friend Jeremy Beckham, who's worked at PETA, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, the Beagle Freedom Project. He's just been one of the leaders in fighting experimentation on dogs for decades. But he did a lot of the original research on this. When you look back into how the use of beagles specifically started in vivisection, it started as part of the Cold War. So many people know that we dropped a couple of atomic bombs mm -hmm. on Japan in the 1940s. And you know, hundreds of thousands of people were immediately incinerated. Many thousands more suffered from radiation sickness and disease and burns for decades. Um, many of them got cancer. And one of the things the government realized after dropping these bombs was, oh shit, we should probably figure out what happens when you drop these bombs. Because among other things, it could affect even our own soldiers. You know, Because after we blow these places away, if our workers, if our soldiers go in and occupy the place. We want to know, is it actually safe to walk close to these places? Also, we're doing nuclear tests all over the place. And we'd like to know what's going to happen to all our workers, all our scientists who are doing these nuclear tests. Is, is there going to be some horrible disease they developed 10 years later? And, and that, that period of time, 10 years later, 20 years later is crucial because when they started trying to figure out, okay, how do we figure out what radiation does to animals? They initially were trying to use monkeys and other animals that mm -hmm. they thought were more similar to human beings. And what they found is None of these animals would endure the tests. If you brought this monkey in to be radiated, if you just look at some of the de devices, like there, there's this thing called a hound holding device. Mm -hmm. It's like a big C. And usually the dog is supposed to be anesthetized. It's supposed to be a test of how much radiation is coming from a dog. And they basically curl the dog up into a C. And, and I have a photo of it on, on my blog. You can check it out. It's called a hound holding device. And if you're doing experiments like this, if you're radiating the dog day after day to the point that at the end of the experiments they did on beagles, for example, in the, the high radiation cohort, there are, I think, five cohorts or six cohorts, I forget, of radiation levels, all of them far higher than what they widely considered to be a safe level of radiation back in the 1950s. But the highest cohort, the average dog, not even the worst dog, the average dog had dozens of bone fractures by the end of the experiment. Oh, my God. If you have a monkey or a, uh, you know, a pig or even a cat, they, if they're being dragged to be radiated every day to the point that their bones are breaking, they will fight back or give up or they, they will not tolerate it, you know, because most animals do not trust us enough to allow us to continue to radiate them and poison them and inject them and mutilate them day after day after day mm -hmm. without some sort of response. And what they found is dogs and specifically beagles with the best breed of dog in terms of size, manageability, and especially their temperament. They have a very docile temperament. And you can beat a beagle over and over again. The beagle will never bite you. That they decided to use beagles. And that was the beginning of the beagle vivisection industry. And it has become an industry. It is now an industry that involves tens of thousands of dogs. Ridgeland alone makes millions and millions of dollars from selling these beagles to labs and universities and vivisection facilities across the nation. And one of the most horrific things about all of this is they torture these dogs because they are the dogs who love and trust us most. Yeah, so, so we're we essentially engage. taking advantage. It's who we can for take advantage of. Advantage of for yeah. being gentle, for being trusting, and for loving us so much. So they specifically use beagles for these long-term experiments where we have to, for example, force feed the dog some toxic substance over and over again over many weeks or months. Or we have to radiate an animal, again, over many weeks and months. And they have to keep coming in, keep coming in almost like a good patient. They want them to be good patients, except 
unbeknownst to the Beagles themselves, they're not patients. Patients. They're victims of torture. Mm -hmm. Do you think that because the US, you know, and I'm talking as a Brit, we, we love dogs. We like to think we love dogs so much. So do you think that the public knowledge about vivisection is just not even really there? Do you think that's why it's being something that's just kind of happening? It's like swept under the rug? Not just being swept under the rug, but actively covered up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's... I'm not a big proponent of conspiracy things, uh, theories. I think most conspiracy theories are nonsense because it's it's actually really hard to hide things, <laughs> you know, especially if it's a big thing. And, you know, certainly torturing millions of dogs is a big thing. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't try. And and just as a concrete example, in the months before we did this investigation, the federal government in the United States has this massive database of animal welfare investigation reports, which re are required by law to be provided to the public at large, because we have a law in the United States called the Freedom of Information Act, mm -hmm. which requires that any public document or inspection, for example, you, know, you cannot file criminal charges against someone to hold it secret, generally. that's There's some exceptions for like terrorism, but even in those cases, there has to be some very specific reason this is not a public document. And the same is true of animal cruelty reports. All these things should be public documents because we don't live in a kangaroo court system. In theory, we live in a system that should be transparent and open for all. It's a democracy. It's not just the king who decides who gets punished, who gets prosecuted. It's all of us. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're entitled to all these public documents. And in the months prior to our entry into Ridgeland, every single one of those animal welfare records that should have been accessible by every citizen in the United States was purged from the public databases oh my by God. the Trump administration. And at the same time, there was a massive decrease in the number of enforcement actions across the nation. So from 2016 to 2018, uh, in the entire year 2018, I think we went, I, I think the number is, I might be slightly off, but this is approximately correct. I think we went from 32 complaints filed, which isn't many, you know, we're talking about hundred million animals. And I think in 2015 or 2016, it was something like 32 complaints for animal cruelty, which is ridiculous. And it's, and for the record, it's not just me saying this again, the, the government's own inspector general has said, this is ridiculous. Their words were enforcement is basically meaningless. We're not protecting these dogs. It's basically meaningless. And so that 32, that 32 complaints that we had in 2016, that was already basically meaningless. When you have hundred million animals, that's like saying there were 32 crimes committed in the United States of America. Right? That's yeah, impossible. It's just, how is I that? mean, people accidentally will commit more crimes than that. You know, yeah. it's just impossible. They could, and actually, let me ask you, you want to guess after these animal welfare reports were purged from public databases, how many complaints do you think were filed in 2018 from 32? Like a hundred? One. Oh my God. One. So according to the federal government, oh there was only God. one instance of animal cruelty out of the oh, likely hundred million on. plus animals in experimentation facilities. No. So this is, this is statistically a cover-up. It yeah. has to be. Yeah. Because there is no industry on the face of the planet Earth that has 100% compliance. You know, I, I consider myself a pretty good driver. I haven't had many speeding tickets or parking tickets in the last 10 years. I had a, a couple parking tickets. And I'm just one person. If you looked at 100 million people, even if they're the best drivers in the world, the odds that none of them has a parking ticket or a speeding ticket, yeah, it becomes statistically virtually impossible. And the government would have us believe that is the case. The bigger problem, though, isn't even so much the cover up alone. It's that the fact that the government's stamp of approval, most people trust the government. Most people think, oh, if there are animals being tortured, surely someone's handling that, right? <laughs> yeah. You'd like to think that there are laws in place to protect animals, and there are. And there are people whose responsibility it is to help protect animals, and there are such people. The problem, again, is most people don't recognize how much of a revolving door it is. Until yeah. you dive deeper into the agency and you realize all the people working for this agency that is supposed to be protecting animals go to jobs where they exploit animals right after they leave the agency. And they're usually hired from jobs where they exploit animals right before they started the agency. It's like in farming. Started, it's like in factory farming. Factory farming yeah. is the same way. Because mm -hmm. in the same guy in the United States who regulates all the factory farms is the guy who regulates the laboratories too. His name is Tom Vilsack. Oh my He's the former governor of Iowa. And before he became secretary of agriculture, he was the president of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. As far as we can tell, he wasn't even doing anything. He didn't even, it was like a 
It was like one of those mob jobs, you know, like mob jobs and Sopranos where no. you just get a job to do nothing. Oh, know? okay. Okay. Yeah. It was like one of those jobs. And I think, I don't remember the exact amount of money, but it was definitely in the millions. I think it was a million or $2 million a year to do nothing. Nice. <laughs> nice for him. I know. I, I wish the animals got that sort of salary. Yeah, that that would be, yeah. Well, I, I want to take a step back. And Can like, I ask you a question? Do you think things are this corrupt in the UK too? Yes, absolutely. Because in the United States, it really is? Yeah, yeah. It, it is anywhere. I think because you've bought me into this conspiracy, like just by saying <laughs> in the, the reports alone, because that's just too good to be true. And yeah. you, you think that they would actually think about that, like think that people might care enough to like see the, but maybe it's because they think they can get away with it which they absolutely can because then people like yourself who go in and rescue these animals and it's seen as theft um have to face the consequences and that's why i'm, I'm thinking of taking a step back and, and, and talking a little more about this trial because it's it's not just you who's going to be facing the consequences potentially uh, there are two other people involved, aren't there? Um, could you tell us more about uh, it's Eva and Paul? Who yeah, are... it's Eva Hamer and Paul Picklesheimer. Eva is a former music therapist, uh, practitioner of nonviolence, who work, currently works for an organization called Pax Fauna that does a lot of really mm -hmm. important research. Paul Picklesheimer is an organizer of Direct Action Everywhere, the organization and network that I used to be a part of. I'm no longer, I'm do, now doing a new thing called Simple Heart, but Paul, still very dear friend, although I'm not allowed to talk to him because of a separate court order. Oh God. He's a former roofer. Yes, he used to actually literally put roofs on agricultural facilities and now he uncovers them instead of covering them up. And yeah, the, the state of Wisconsin has brought felony burglary and theft charges against us and with a potential sentence of up to 16 years for taking these distressed beagles to receive veterinary care. Why is the charge so high? Is it because it's seen as just theft and they're seen as property? It's high because they're trying to deter us. They're trying to scare us. Um, the biomedical industry and the agricultural industry are incredibly powerful and have enormous political influence. And in Dane County specifically, Covance, a company that is involved in enormous amount of animal testing, is one of the largest private employers in the entire county. I looked at the top 20 employers, and I think about half of them are involved in biomedical research or the biomedical industry in some way. And so you know, a lot of these elected officials, the people paying for their campaigns are people in the biomedical industry. That doesn't mean the people like what the biomedical industry is doing, because a lot of times, even the employees at these facilities don't like the companies because the, the same companies that exploit animals will also mistreat their own employees. Oh, yeah. But in terms of the money and the control and the political influence, Dane County, Wisconsin is a county where the biomedical industry is incredibly powerful. And they're coming after us hard because they want this work to be stopped. Were you expecting uh, a consequence of potentially 16 years or, or were you expecting more or less? So the severity of charges has been surprising to me because mm -hmm. historically there have been prosecutions of open rescue, but typically they've sought lesser charges, maybe misdemeanor charges, maybe a lower level felony that might involve a year or two. So you may have heard that I was recently incarcerated, for example, and I yeah, was. You were, yeah. And the maximum sentence in that case was only six years because they didn't bring a felony burglary charge. They brought a felony conspiracy charge. And the conspiracy in that case it was a case involving a large egg factory farm at mm -hmm. which I organized a demonstration of 500 people. And I ended up being convicted of conspiracy to trespass because a large number of those activists walked onto the farm and began giving aid to the animals. Uh, but the sentence in that case was up to six years. So this case is 16 years. And I think what we're seeing is an increasing usage of the most heavy handed tactics by the most powerful industries in order to chill and scare activists from doing work that the industry know is effective at stopping them and swaying public opinion against their practices. And do you have a jury like that's comprised of the public like the UK do? Yeah. So do you? Yeah, so th and, sorry. And that's no. one of the. That's one of the, the, the real geniuses of the jury system, that instead of having to make your case before elected bureaucrats who might be in bed with the industry, before you know, career judges who are part of the legal elite of a particular county, you get a chance to make your case before ordinary people. Yeah. And I, I'm hopeful, and I would say even confident, that if we are actually given a chance to make our arguments, to a set of 12 ordinary people, they'll be swayed. 
Yeah, now, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking because they're they're dogs and not like pigs yeah. and chickens. There's speciesism. Like the, there will be some sort of effect. So is that making you feel a bit more confident that you will be it able does. to? Yeah. Yeah, it makes me more confident that we can sway people to understand why we all need the right to rescue and animals have the right to be rescued. But also I think it, it's going to present some pretty awesome opportunities to expand beyond the normal animal rights audience because there are a lot of non-vegans who are going to hopefully hear about this trial and be shocked into recognizing our legal system has to reform. Mm -hmm. And let me just clarify what I mean by that, because by reform, I don't even necessarily mean the legal system has to change. I think even if you look at the existing legal and constitutional provisions in the United States, animal liberation is required. Yes. So let me explain that. Yes, please. In the U.S. Constitution, there we have something called the Bill of Rights that a lot of people have heard of. Mm -hmm. And under the Bill of Rights, there are a number of rights that are given to any person in this country. And for a long time, slaves were not considered persons. No. Women were not considered persons. No. Gay people, at least if they're out and open, were also not considered persons who are entitled to equal protection under the law, which is why same-sex marriage for a long time was constitutionally prohibited. Mm -hmm. A number of Supreme Court justices in black robes decided for all the millions of LGBTQ citizens in the United States, you are not equal, you're not even a person, you don't have constitutional rights. Those decisions were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Slaves are human beings mm -hmm. and persons. Women are persons yeah. and LGBTQ folks are persons. Yeah. And what happened was there was political uproar in all these movements that pushed and cajoled and pressured these powerful people to realize the common sense moral intuition that so many of us have that wait, just because someone has black skin, they're a thing. Just because someone is a woman rather than a man, they don't have the right to vote. Just because someone is gay rather than straight, they're not a person for the purpose of equal protection and the right to marry. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. In the same way, while it might seem radical to a lot of people at first, when you start asking yourself, is a dog, a piece of garbage, a thing, a piece of property, or are they a person? Which are the only real two choices under the legal, under the law, something can be a person or property. Mm -hmm. Most Americans, and frankly, most, I've said this many times, most six-year-old children can recognize <laughs> there is a difference between a dog and a chair. Okay. You kick the chair, the chair doesn't cry. You kick the dog and everyone's going to be mad at you because you just hurt a sentient being. Mm -hmm. and, and I think our legal system already has all the provisions that are necessary because, for example, our constitution guarantees that no person may de be deprived of their life or liberty without due process of law. And we have billions of animals who are denied both their lives and liberty without any process, much less due process of law. Due process means you've got to give everyone sufficient legal protections. They need to be able to make their case before you take their life or liberty away. Yep. Right now, we have billions of animals whose lives and liberties are being, are being taken from them because they're not considered persons at all. And that's just biologically and scientifically invalid. Yeah, well, you say on the the Right to Rescue website, um, and that's linked below for everyone watching, um, that this could be a, a major turning point in the movement to end animal experimentation, you know, this this yeah. trial. Um, can you expand on how this could be, you know, I'm not familiar with law. Yep. I don't know how this case could be something that would lead to that turning point. Yeah. So let me just back up and, and say one thing about, especially the English system, which the American government, the UK government, we all operate under the English common law system, uh, which is especially true of the English system, but is also true of civil law systems in France and Germany to some extent, to a lesser extent, but to some extent. And that is that a lot of law just depends on the interpretations of legal practitioners, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, even ordinary people. And it's called the common law, right? What is the common understanding of certain terms? Due process of law, equal protection, freedom of speech, life and liberty, and person. That's a very important one, person. Mm -hmm. And what the law is, is not necessarily just what's written on a piece of paper, but what people interpret that piece of paper to mean in the community at large. And again, we've seen major shifts in the law over the last few hundred years in the United States, just because we evolved in our understanding of, for example, whether a person of color is also a person. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step. The second step is in these legal cases specifically, it is very hard to get in a court to address the question of animal rights or animal person at all, because most courts just dismiss you outright. They just say, 
sorry, animals are not people. Therefore, you don't even have a case. I don't even have to pay attention to this. And so animals are, for the most part, invisible to the legal system. And what we've done in these right to rescue cases is leverage our own personhood. And no one doubts that I'm a person, you know, mm -hmm. hundred years ago, not so much because Chinese people were excluded from this country. We're denied citizenship rights. There's a law in the books called the Chinese Exclusion Act. We're still the only race that has ever been specifically targeted for denial of citizenship rights, citizenship rights in American history. There's never been a race where the U.S. government has said, you know, we just don't like people who look like you, so you can't become a citizen. Oh my but that's changed. And everyone recognizes that I'm a person now, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what the right to rescue cases allow us to do is leverage our personhood to create personhood for animals. Because when we go to rescue an animal, the legal system has to bring a case against us and we have to have the right to defend ourselves because I'm a person. They can't just incarcerate me or stop me from doing something without due process of law. Mm -hmm. But crucially, our primary argument when we end up in court is you acknowledge that I'm a person and I'm gonna defend myself by saying this action that you say is a crime is defending another person, namely a dog, mm -hmm. right? And even if they can deny me that the right directly to argue the, the animal has rights because the courts just say, sorry, this, there's no precedent for dogs bringing court cases, for dogs being victims of crime, for them being persons. But in our cases, we are defensively asserting personhood to protect our own rights. And so the question the judge and the jury will be asked to answer is, in a situation where an animal is in distress, should the legal system, and frankly, should our entire society treat that animal in distress more like a dented can, which is literally an argument that a prosecutor once made, that a damaged animal, a pig, a cow who's sick, who's injured, who's on the brink of death, it's like a damaged can in a grocery store. Wow. So the, the question the court will be asked to answer is, is this animal more like a dented can or are they more like a living being who deserves respect? Mm -hmm. And And that is... It might seem like a very narrow question and for the case for the purposes of our specific case it is in many ways narrow because the only question is is the court allowed to incarcerate me for taking the actions i've taken but the crucial thing is once we formalize the idea that animals are not dented cans they're living beings then suddenly there's a huge host of rights that potentially lawyers and judges and ordinary people can legitimately argue the court system has already acknowledged including the right to life and liberty so the doctrine of law that we're relying on is called necessity and necessity gives you the right to protect a person even when protecting that person involves some breach of the law right and am i am i right in thinking that there have been some animals throughout history like recently who have been granted personhood is that something that the us has seen it's debatable uh, okay. But not not in a very clear way. And every case that's being litigated is is a it's an opportunity to keep pushing down that path. Right. But for example, the most straightforward personhood cases have been cases brought by the recently deceased Steve Wise at the Non Human Rights Project. Mm -hmm. There's there's uh, an amazing HBO documentary. I think it's called Unlocking the Cage, about Steve Wise's work. But he brought a habeas corpus petition on behalf of an elephant at the Brooklyn Zoo, whose uh -huh. name is Happy. Basically arguing, if an elephant is a person, then you have to justify the denial of their liberty, right? You can't just keep this elephant in a cage all day. And it was dismissed outright because the court ruled that an animal is not a person. There have been other cases brought on behalf of killer whales, on behalf of chimpanzees, primarily the most cognitively sophisticated animals. And those cases are important. I'm 100% supportive of them. But they're a lot, lot harder because they're considered offensive cases rather than defensive cases. And what I mean by that is these are cases where you're trying to take away someone else's rights. You're gonna say, this elephant is a person and therefore, you know, the Brooklyn Zoo doesn't have the right to do what it's doing. Well, in our cases, the assertion of personhood for animals is being exercised defensively. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm trying to take anyone else's rights away. I'm just saying, hey, you can't throw me in jail on the grounds that a pig is a dented can or a dog is a piece of garbage because any second grader knows there's a big difference between those two types of things. Right. Mm -hmm. And historically, one of the reasons criminal cases have been so important to so many social justice movements is that historically, both society at large and the legal system are more willing to recognize defensive assertions of rights rather than offensive assertions of rights. In other words, if I can say I'm not trying to take anyone else's rights away, I'm just trying to defend myself. It's a lot easier to assert a right than if I say, you know, for example, 
I'm gay and you have to make a cake for me. You know, mm -hmm. I think people should be, and, and this is actually a real Supreme Court case where it's been litigated recently and they lost, they actually lost because it was considered an offensive assertion of gay rights, oh, right? Okay. Because you're saying you have a cake shop, you have to make cakes for me as a gay person. Mm -hmm. That is different from saying, hey, I'm gay. I don't want you, don't, don't, I'm not trying to interview with anyone else. But don't, can you just not throw me in jail because I'm gay? That would be a nice thing. Yeah, like, just be nice. throw me in jail. Yeah, please. <laughs> that, that is an easier case to make. I think both offensive and defensive assertions of rights are important. And I'm glad people brought litigation on behalf of the couple that wanted, the gay couple that wanted a cake made for their, their wedding. Mm -hmm. But historically and sociologically, it's harder to make those offensive cases than a defensive case, which is what we're doing. And so this is... The, the, def the defensive cases that you, you get yourself into. Um, can you, you like tell us a bit more about your background and, and why you're so interested in the legal side of all of this? Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I, I did not end up a lawyer because I had any particular interest in the law. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm honestly still not sure I have any particular interest in the law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm kind of an accidental lawyer. I was actually much more interested in in scholarship. And even when I went to law school, I thought I was going to be a scholar. And I became interested in the law mostly because I think the law is the most important social norm. And a social norm is, is just, is a belief that many people commonly hold about appropriate behavior by others. So it's not just what I believe, right? It's not, I think people should have gay rights or I think animals should be treated well. It's my belief about what you think about what other people think, about the public at large thinks. Yeah. And there's enormous amount of research that if you're trying to change the world, persuading people is actually not as effective as changing social norms. In other words, I can try and convince you all day and night that gay people should have rights. And if you're a homophobe, the odds of me changing your mind are pretty low. Mm -hmm. In contrast, if I can convince you that regardless of what you think, everyone else has changed their mind, that is actually extremely effective not only at getting that person who's homophobic to change their behaviors, but in the long term, changing their views too. Mm -hmm. Because human beings are highly social animals. And one of the most convincing things I can do to show you that you are wrong in the way you think is convincing you that everyone else in the world has already changed their mind about the subject. Right? And the reason the law is such an important social norm is that when we collectively decide some moral issue is important enough, has been settled enough, that we should make it a norm that everyone must comply with under penalty of incarceration with a threat of force by the state, we turn that norm into a law. Murder, I'm... rape, theft, all these things that we think are clearly wrong. And we want everyone to understand, no matter what you think about this, even if you have a philosophical position about murder, you know, there's a lot of people in the human extinction movement who think human beings are scum mm -hmm. and, you know, they may have a philosophical position that it's okay to kill humans. Nonetheless, in oh our God. society, we've decided, <laughs> I don't care what you personally believe, you're just not allowed to kill people. It makes me think of when I was growing up, indoor smoking was permissible mm, by law. Then suddenly exactly. overnight, yep. it stopped. And then you were, you were the scum of the earth if you smoked indoors. Yeah, you're right. It's, and it's all social norms. It's, it's, it's because everyone just kind of realize, oh, there's a shift in society. And mm -hmm. I remember that too. I'm old enough. I'm surprised you remember that. You don't look old <laughs> I'm <enough>. 27. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah, I, I'm just, maybe UK is later than us. In it this, was but, later, uh, I think, yeah. Okay, but, uh, yeah. A society yeah, in the United smokers. States, there was a very strong anti-smoking movement. And yeah, by, by I'd say the 90s, you know, public smoking, smoking in public faces was basically banned. I mean, I saw just, the, I saw basically a very tail end of it just the, the very end of that phase in American history. But you're right, it's changed very rapidly. And we can do the same thing for eating animals and experimenting animals. We have to create norms. And, and again, we can't. We probably won't change the entire legal system in one fell swoop. What, what's gonna do is, what's gonna happen is we'll chip it away at it, and then at some point there will be a flood. But that is typically what happens of not just legal change, but other forms of change. You chip away, you chip away, chip away, and eventually the entire dam breaks open. Exactly. I, I, this seems like a silly question coming from a, a, vegan, a vegan, but why specifically did you think to save the beagles on that day? Why is that something that particularly interested you? Yeah, I mean, first, because they clearly needed help, mm -hmm. you know, and I, as a Buddhist, it is my, my, my duty 
um, to, to help any animal suffering from violence or cruelty to give them aid and, and suffer myself if I have to, to intervene. And, mm -hmm. and that's actually one of the legal arguments we're going to bring in court too, that I, this is a frustration of my religious freedom because in the Wisconsin constitution, uh -huh. anytime someone's religious duties are being burdened, there has to be a compelling state interest on the other side. Um, but you know, for me, yeah, it's, it's, there have been cases that have actually been won on that argument, which is, was a little surprising to me when I started researching this. But in America, religious liberty is, is very, very important, given the history of this country. But yeah, but for me personally, I mean, it goes back to, to what we talked about earlier, about just the gentleness and the, the vulnerability of these animals. I mean, what does it say about us as a species, as a civilization, that the most gentle and vulnerable beings on this earth are treated with utter contempt and brutality? Um, Especially given they are so, you know, as, as we said earlier, we, we, we take complete advantage of their, yeah, their gentleness. Yeah. And, and it's worse. Just worse. And I think most people can understand why that is so horrifically evil to do. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but, you know, I think that historically, when you look at what sort of social change works, again, social norms are really important. But another thing that's really important is People who want change have to be willing to sacrifice for it. It's yes. not enough just to talk. It's not enough even just to donate. I mean, those are all great things. And I'm saying, by all means, talk and donate more to help animals. But movements, not every single person, but movements, there has to be a tip of the spear where people are making real sacrifices. Because if you don't put skin in the game, no one else is going to listen. And that's exactly what we found. I mean, I'm a published author in the New York Times. Um, I just published an article in the Harvard Law Review which is the most important legal publication in the nation. It's not because I'm a particularly good lawyer or law professor. I mean, I was a failed law professor. I dropped out for a reason because I sell. I was terrible at the job. Okay. It's, it's because I put skin in the game mm -hmm. and, and people have seen that sacrifice and they're curious about it. Yeah, as soon um, as your like your last trial was, it was everywhere. Just because people yeah. sympathize with the fact that like, even if they, they for some reason didn't agree with the, the, the plight, that the animals were going through like the fact that you were there and you were saying look i am willing to suffer yeah. the consequences is enough for people to sympathize and think okay well yeah. what's so important that wayne is deciding to risk his freedom for yeah yeah no it's i mean in many ways so i, I, I bet you've heard of these challenge videos on youtube Ch yes yeah a few yeah, like mr beast right <laughs> yeah no. i tried to eat ten thousand hot dogs in one day, you know, something well, stupid but, like yeah. that. Like, but his challenges are dumb and hilarious. Uh, I mean, I won't say dumb. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people find them meaningful. Mm -hmm. And he did, he did do a video where he saved like a thousand dogs recently, which is yeah. pretty awesome. Um, but one of the things that psychologists have found that just naturally draws human attention is big challenges because they make for very good stories. Um, yeah. And there's an old mantra about storytelling. This is just important for anyone who's in the the business of persuasion and anyone who's vegan you should be in the business of persuasion mm -hmm. one of the mantras i heard a long time ago is i think it was written by a guy by the name of daniel coyle who's just one of the best nonprofit authors in the nation is the bigger the challenge the better the story and trials are a natural challenge there's a clash between one force and another mm -hmm. you know the prosecution literally wants to put me in jail <laughs> they want to lock me in a cage and i desperately do not want to be in a cage um there's a difference in power, right? I'm going up against the US government, which is the most powerful organization in the history of the planet Earth. Yep. And it's me and a bunch of vegans who don't have much money and don't have any guns or tanks mm -hmm. or police or cages. All we have is the power of compassion or love. And that makes for a natural story, a natural challenge that people, even outside of the movement, are incredibly drawn to. And we have to think about that because, and I'm sure you think about that in your podcast, but if you start a YouTube channel or a podcast, you're not just competing with other animal rights groups. In fact, I don't think you're competing with other animal rights groups at all. No. You're not competing with other social justice causes. You're competing with Netflix. Yeah. You're competing with HBO. You're competing with Lionel Messi, mm -hmm. you know, for people's attention. And one thing that we have as activists that Netflix and Lionel Messi do not have is we're not playing a damn game. No. This is real life and there are real stakes. You know, and same thing with Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast, his videos are great. And, you know, I'm certainly glad. And in some cases, they're real. Like, he actually did save, apparently, a bunch of dogs, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But most of his 
challenges are kind of fabricated. They're not real challenges. At any point, anyone can just say like, oh yeah, this is too much. You know, I'm, I'm done, mm -hmm. right? I don't have that choice. If I lose, I could go to prison for 16 years. And that is a real challenge. And it's honestly terrifying. I don't want to go to prison. I'm, my dog is in the office right next door. This is the creature I love more than anyone in the world. On Wednesday, I will say goodbye to him and I may never see him again. That may be the last time I ever see the one I love more than anyone on the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. That is a real challenge that Lionel Messi will never have, no. or unless he becomes an animal rights activist and starts rescuing dogs, which, by the way, Lionel, if you're listening, start doing that because we'd love to have you. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, whether he wins the World Cup or gets, you know, takes Miami to the, the Champions League or whatever it is, doesn't matter mm -hmm. compared to the challenges we have. And, and that's one of the reasons why people have to be willing to sacrifice, because when you sacrifice, it's a good story. Exactly. And... Are you able to talk about the day that you rescued the beagles or is this something that could affect the trial? Like, don't worry if it's not something you can talk about, but you, maybe your feelings and, you know, what yeah, you yeah, no, I can, I can talk about it. And I have talked about it a lot. So because, mm -hmm. you know, part of Open Rescue is that we're completely transparent. We're not. Yeah. I mean, the only reason we know they even know, you know, who took these dogs is because we told them. <laughs> <laughs> I told them exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I've written about this. I. Um, I blogged about this recently and, and now I'm completely forgetting the name of the blog. Um, but one of the, the terrifying things about that experience is, um, oh, it's the two words that can save millions of dogs. The two words, okay. The name of the blog. Um, one of the, the horrible things about that day is we almost left Julie behind. Really? Um, yeah, even though she was the dog who all of, our investigators agreed was the one in the worst shape of all the thousands of dogs, or I guess we probably saw hundreds of dogs. I don't know if we saw thousands, we saw hundreds for sure. She was definitely in the worst shape. And um, the reason we almost left her behind us because alarms went off. And one of my team members uh, came up to me and I, cause I couldn't actually even hear the alarms. That's how loud it was in there. And this is a huge blaring alarm, you know, all over the facility that probably people miles away could hear it. When you've got thousands of dogs howling in agony and desperate to escape, you just can't, you can't even hear yourself think. It was so loud in there. I mean, to the point that a lot of our team members like, I wonder if I'm going to have some sort of hearing damage Jesus. from being in the facility. So I didn't hear the alarm. And initially, um, you know, I said to myself and I told the team, I can't do this. You know, we got to go. We, we have to save ourselves. And I don't want to give it away. People should read the blog. Yeah. But um, something happened that convinced me to stop and, and turn back and say like, no, we have to go back. And we did. And it's, it's kind of mind blowing. Cause I, you know, Julie's my good friend now. I mean, I, I love her more than almost anybody in my life other than Oliver. I mean, I, I carried out myself and I, I try to spend as much time with her as possible. And she's still just such a beautiful creature because, you know, and this is just something I've learned over the years that the ones who suffer the most and have the most disabilities are often the ones who give us back the most too. Mm -hmm. uh, because because she has PTSD, because she's blind, and the world is a very scary place to her, she has very special attachments to a few people, like her mom, Diana, um, and, and me. Like, I'm one of the people. Everyone else she's scared of. And, and that's so special that yeah. every time I get to see her, you know, most people, she cries in fear and spins uncontrollably and runs away when they come into the house. And then for me, I mean, she still often circles because she's, you know, she's brain damaged. She, she was psychiatrically tormented by the abuse. So she'll, she'll often spin almost like some sort of tornado, but she'll spin towards me. And she's, she's literally howling in, in glee. She's so happy to see me. She cries and she runs up to me and runs into my lap. And, and to think this, this creature, this, this friend of mine, I mean, she's, every time I see her, I tell her, you might, I mean, other than my own dog, you're my best friend, Julie. Like to think I could have left my best friend to suffer in anguish in that cage potentially for years and then die in some awful experiment it's just kind of mind-blowing what's yeah. even more mind-blowing is the thought that you know the only reason i know this about julie and i feel this about julie is because i know julie mm -hmm. but i could have known every one of the beagles in that facility exactly. all six thousand four thousand five thousand however many were there that night and and none of those beagles got out and you know our hope with this trial is that when people see what's happening and the world starts talking about this even the government and our legal system acknowledges that we should not be torturing these animals in a cage. No. We should be taking them out and giving them the love they deserve. Absolutely.
And just so we're aware, because we've been talking about the trial and what you face, if we can ask again, what is entailed for a beagle? What can they expect uh, from a facility like this? So first is they, they never get to step outside, see the sun, step on grass, or even feel something soft, probably. You know, each of these dogs is raised in a wire cage. They will live either one or two to a cage, probably for their entire lives. Um, second, the cage size is about twice the length of their bodies under federal law. And again, this is a law that's rarely enforced, where the inspector general said is basically meaningless. And and this is not a very high standard. The standard that's required under federal law in the United States is the cage has to be six inches longer than the length of the beagle. And if that cage size is doubled, in other words, if the cage is approximately twice the size of the beagle's length, the dog never has to step outside their entire lives. And this is, this is a clear violation of the federal statute because the federal statute says the animals have to be raised in humane conditions. And the USDA, that same agency that's run by Tom Vilsack, that, you know, dairy executive. Oh, yeah. Who, who's basically a part of the industry and, it, it, you know, gets a cool million or two for, for doing, doing nothing, nothing yep. and goes to work for the government. Mm -hmm. He runs this agency. They've interpreted that law in a regulation that says that giving a dog a cage that's twice the length of their own body is humane. <laughs> wow. Right? That's preposterous. If any of us did this to a dog, just in our homes, if, if your neighbor did this, you'd be horrified. And you'd probably call the police at some point mm -hmm. and say, this, they, they've left this dog in a cage endlessly. The dog never even goes outside. They never turn the lights off. The dog is just trapped there day after day. This is, this is torture. And we know that animals of all sorts, including human beings, when caged like this for long periods of time, sometimes even for short periods of time. I and mean, one of the most startling statistics I've ever read was, an industry veterinary investigation of gestation crates showing that gestation crates are these cages that mother pigs are forced to live yeah. in one hour of, of observation. Actually, let me ask you, they observed these mother pigs in one hour yeah. at a gestation crate facility. What percentage do you think exhibited stereotypic and psychotic behavior? Oh, it's got to be like 98% or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're educated, so you know, <laughs> but for the average citizen, yeah. they're probably like, oh, I mean, Hopefully not less than one or five, you know, like it can't be that bad, right? 92%. Oh my God. 92%. And that's just in one hour, in one hour of observation. So this is something every one of those beagles was going through. Um, yeah. And so, you know, when we saw these beagles and, you know, the trauma in, affects the, the dogs in a different way, but some of them are literally broken, you know, physically broken in terms of their legs not functioning. Uh, mentally broken in terms of their the neural network and their brain just doesn't function anymore. The normal patterns of neural activity don't happen because they're so denied, deni they're denied so much stimulation that their brains literally fall apart. That you can even see it if you do an MRI in someone who has a serious psychotic condition, their brain activity is suppressed. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's considered humane. And of course, within the industry regulating itself, it's, it's going to say it's humane. But yeah, people will, there'll be cruelty charges against animals for, for less. Uh, if, yeah. But when the industry does it suddenly, uh, it's absolutely fine. Um, if you had 60 seconds, you were given 60 seconds, what would you say to somebody about the animal rights movement and why they should be focusing so heavily on this upcoming trial? What is it about this upcoming trial that means the animal rights movement should be focusing on, 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 on the case? There is more suffering inflicted on animals than has ever existed in the history of the planet Earth. And we have an incredible opportunity, not just to save three beagles and keep a couple activists, including me, out of prison, but change the lives of trillions of creatures across the face of the planet Earth, dogs and cats pigs and cows and wild animals too. And it doesn't require much for most ordinary people. The question of veganism is a harder question. Of course, we can answer together. But before we decide individually, everyone should be vegan, we should. Let's decide whether animals should be treated like living beings. And if you agree with that, then you're already part of the animal rights movement and we need your support.
that is amazing and we're coming towards the the end of our like our meeting um i want to make sure though that people know that when they come away that there are things that they can do to help outside this case obviously it's a case that's happening it's kind of in the hands of the law but at the same time that there are uh, there's a newsletter could you maybe tell people about that that's linked below yeah so we we have a big day of action coming out on march 18th and i'm actually in the process of drafting the newsletter we're going to release about that day of action. It's called the Beagle Betrayal Day of Action, where we're going to ask the government of the United States in Wisconsin to recognize that these dogs are living beings and for them to protect them. Instead of going after the people who tried to give them aid, let's work to protect them from the people who are trying to hurt them. That's on March 18th, the first day of the trial. We're asking people to call, email, and make a social media post on whatever platforms you use with the hashtag Beagle Betrayal, just pointing out that we live in a world where a dog can be treated like literal garbage, like literal, literally thrown into a landfill and burned. And that's not right. And again, the law is not just about these fancy people in robes. It's about all of us. And that's even about people internationally. All of us have a common power in terms of our speech, our communities, our social networks to reshape the way human beings and human civilization see animals. And this trial will be a tremendous opportunity to do that, not just for dogs, but for other animals. So go to simpleheart.org, simple heart, um, just, you know, simple minded, simple hearted, simpleheart.org and sign up to our newsletter. And, you know, I'll be sharing more about what you can do, but stay tuned on March 18th. Hopefully we'll see lots of people on social media posting something with that hashtag to, to support these beagles and, and help us create a world where these beagles aren't treated like test tubes. And so this is March 18th. Will there be anybody like the Simple Heart Initiative? Will there be uh, somebody like filming outside the event? Or I, I know that in the US you can actually film inside. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, I think the the judge is permitting some in-court cameras. So there probably will be some social media okay. allowed. And, and I'll certainly send that to people on that simpleheart.org once we find out about it. Um, and we will definitely be doing social media on that day. So... If you follow my Instagram, I'm sure I'm going to put out an update on Instagram and Twitter, both before and after the first day of trial. We also have a very important argument on March 8th on the question of animal personhood. Okay. So I'll be, I'm flying to Wisconsin this Wednesday, um, but that's kind of provisional. And the big thing we want people to do is support us on the first day of trial. So by all means, stay tuned for March 8th. We'll give you an update on how that argument goes. It's possible the judge decides that issue by the end of the day. But the big day of action is going to be on March 18th, and we'd love everyone to support and participate. And just so are aware, with, with cases, is there a chance that you won't have the verdict on the day? Or will you you know that day? Yeah, we the trial is currently scheduled for one week, but it could go two weeks. Right. And the jury could deliberate as long as the jury needs. In theory, the jury can go a month and keep deliberating every day before they reach a verdict. Totally and it has to be a unanimous verdict. So whether it's an acquittal or a conviction, everybody has to agree, which is one of the more unique features of the American legal system. Ah, so we could be waiting for a while. Okay, so it's like a game of tennis, only with more <laughs> challenge, <laughs> only more challenge. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. That, yeah, people can sign up to the newsletter and that's actually linked down below. I want to say thank you, Wayne, so much for coming on and talking about this. This is heavily important. If It's like groundbreaking if it can have some sort of effect on yeah. the law and as you say these social norms that change uh suddenly changes the people uh, are there right. any final words before we uh, depart today well I, I always like to leave people with the 10 words that have motivated me in my organizing for the last 15 years of my life and and they are find your voice speak truth find your voice find some friends and fight like hell if you follow those 10 words you will create change both in your life and in the lives of many people around you. Thank you so much, Wayne. I, I do hope you're well to everyone who's watched and to everybody, please make sure to like this and share this about so people can see what's happening. I do hope you're well. And until next time, we will see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you.